to straight talk with Zafar Subhan, one-on-one -on -one conversations with newsmakers and opinion shapers. I'm Zafar Subhan, Dhaka Tribune editor, and my guest today is Nassim Manzoor, managing director of Apex Footwear Limited and a past president of the MCCI Bangladesh. Nassim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Zafar. It's my pleasure. And what I wanted to talk to you about is that uh, uh, perhaps unknowingly or unwittingly, you have created a bit of a social media storm over the past week with your comments at a recent webinar. webinar. The comments, uh, the webinar was on FDI, if I'm not wrong, but the comments which you made, which really have had people talking and discussing, were to do with the tax regimen here in Bangladesh. So could you perhaps, um, for our viewers here today, could you elaborate or first share what you said in that um, forum and then elaborate a little on the ideas uh, behind what led you to make that statement? Well, Zafar, uh, you've known me for a very, very long time, and I think you know that I, I don't even have a Facebook account. So when I was speaking at that webinar, I had, uh, if I had known possibly uh, this outcome, maybe I would have been a little bit more tempered in my yeah. words. But I, I, I did mean what I said, though, and I think the context was very important. The context was, uh, FDI and what are we doing in Bangladesh to get more FDI, particularly in the context of LDC graduation, uh, which as we know is around the corner practically for Bangladesh. Yeah. And I was very uh, happy because uh, that webinar was actually co-hosted by the Economic Reporters Forum, of which I'm sure you are also a, a member, uh, and right. who represent journalists who talk about economic uh, matters and policies and issues in the business community. And I thought it was the right platform to talk talk about why we as the local Bangladeshi community of business people and entrepreneurs feel that we simply haven't done enough uh, to make Bangladesh attractive for foreign investment and also easier for local business people to survive and prosper. We've yeah. done very well, there's no doubt about it, but we should have done a lot better. And I and think, I think those are two sides of the same coin, you see, because, you know, if things were easier for local businessmen to do business, that is in fact one of the things which would attract. You know, you can't have one without the other. You can't have exactly. a, a, a foreign investment attracted without a healthy business climate inside the country. Exactly. In fact, that was the point that I made to the BIDA chairman. I, I, we said that, look, the first thing that any potential foreign investor does is they come and talk to existing investors, be they local or foreign, and they say, how's your business? How is it to do business here? Uh, it's much more credible listening to another business rather than listening necessarily to the government agency attracted or you know yeah. designated to get it. So I think what really uh, is particularly difficult at this moment is the post-COVID, or I would say the existing COVID situation in the world, which as we know has decimated uh, you know, trillions of dollars from the global economy. It shaved off half of global growth, and we all know, uh, you know it's still far from over. And given that context and that we are about to enter yet another budget cycle, we are waiting for another budget that will be announced you know, uh, very soon, in a couple of months, what are we doing to actually make business easier? What are we doing to help businesses survive? And I think that's where I kind of started off from. And then it, for some reason, it became viral for, we, I have no idea no, why. And, I, and that is exactly where I'd like to take our conversation today. Let's start, of course, talking a little bit about the tax regimen, because that was kind of the specific point you had made. And, um, and I actually have uh, uh, points I'd like to, I, I'd like to um, add, that, add to that as well. But yeah, you know, I mean, what is it about the tax system in Bangladesh? It's, it's kind of sort of unbelievable in that, you know, so many people are outside the tax um, net somehow, but it seems to me that, you know, if you are to announce yourself to the tax authorities and, you know, if you're running businesses or, or you have employees who are, are paid regular salaries, then of course you're going to be in the tax net. But the way it works is no sooner do you then, uh, do you then, uh, do you announce yourself, then the pain begins. So well, what's your incentive? You tell me, right? Exactly. I, I think that was exactly the point that I was trying to make that, uh, you know, in Bangladesh, uh, you know, business community gets a very bad rap, partially justified and somewhat unjustified. I think the majority of the business community, the majority of the society would actually like to pay taxes and operate within the rules simply because life is a lot easier. But the reward and the incentive system to actually pay taxes versus not paying taxes is completely skewed. 
uh, you know, Rizwan Rahman, the president of the Dhaka Chamber, he actually made the point. He said, if I don't pay taxes this year, I've saved myself 32%. And next year, I show that as undeclared tax and I can pay 10%. And as long as I have no moral qualms and I can sleep very well at night, I have no, I've saved 22%. Now, that's a lot of money. So what and are you saying? You're selling? allowed to do that. That is actually the system we have in place. Right. Yeah. And what's your incentive? Yeah, absolutely. So what you're saying, and this is very dangerous, I think it's a moral hazard, is that basically then you are encouraging people to not pay their taxes. And not right. only that, you're disincentivizing people like you and me who continue to pay taxes. So I only say partially in jest that in Bangladesh, we pay taxes for those of us who do, and we also pay for those of us who don't. So that yeah. is where I have a problem. So if you look at the large taxpayers unit, LTU, which of which most of the MCCI members are a part, uh, we have no problem being a part of that. And we are proud because we also can then demand services and a certain quality right. of life from the government. But it's incredible where every quarter, literally, we will get a call from the various people in the tax unit and saying, sir, we are not meeting our targets. We're not meeting our targets. We need to hit you up for some more money. Now, that cannot be a way, a sustainable way of running your tax regime. Right. That, that's absolutely bizarre when you think about it. That, yeah. you know, that that's, that's how the tax authorities are going to plan to go about meeting their shortfalls. Correct. Yeah. So instead of actually trying to, uh, shall I say, cultivate more geese who could possibly lay some eggs, all you're doing is you continue to <laughs> squeeze the few geese who actually do lay some eggs. And that's extremely counterproductive because it's deterrent to anybody else to want to come into the tax net. Now, mm. after this thing became viral, I was inundated with WhatsApp calls, messages from CEOs of multinational corporations, you know, managing directors of big local corporates saying, Great, fantastic. You said it. You know you said it. You should have you should have said more. And I said to all of them, Well, why don't you say it? Why am I the only yeah. person sticking my neck out here and risking God knows what? All of them are like, no, we don't want to be targeted. We don't want to have to be, you know, um, pay the consequences of, of speaking out. This is also very dangerous, Zafar. I think we yeah. cannot practice self-censorship. I think there are still very sensible people in the administration who need to hear this. We need to say it forcefully, but we need to say it objectively. This is what is working, but more importantly, this is what is not working. And let me give you some amazing examples of tax management in Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, in the last tax uh, budget, in the last year's budget, our uh, distinguished tax authorities decided that foreign travel for business should be capped at 0.5% of our turnover. Now, let's say you are a, you're a garment exporter. You're a pretty big cheese in this country. You export a couple of hundred million dollars, and somebody decides in some tax office that your travel bill cannot be more than zero point. Suppose it's 1%, suppose it's 3%, but the company is making money, you earn more profit, wouldn't you pay more taxes? So who has decided on what basis? I can find no example in the world where some right. tax authority decides what should be my travel allowance or what should be the amount of money I spend on travel. Whether the company is publicly owned or privately owned, we should we not leave it up to the owners to decide what amount of travel is commensurate for our business? And they say, well, if it's more than 0.5%, you can do it, but we will not allow it as a tax deduction, as a tax deductible expense. Ridiculous. Doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Let me give you some more. Um, acceptable promotional expenses for marketing. I mean, this is a this is a this is a real winger. This is you are capped at 0.5 percent of turnover. 0.5 percent. Any FMCG guru of whom you've had many on the show will tell you that they spend anywhere from five to ten percent. If you're looking at uh, let's say e-commerce sites, they might be spending 25 percent. By this definition, you know Amazon or eBay or Alibaba in Bangladesh would probably be in, in violation of all tax laws because they would be spending more than what they're allowed. So are we saying those are poorly run businesses? Is that the message that we're giving? I don't understand this. So who comes countries, they simply don't, you know, I was going to say, who does the math to decide that this is an appropriate uh, amount? And what you're telling me is no, actually, you know, it's a hopeless um, case to try and do the math. And in most countries, they don't even bother because they understand there's no way a tax authority can figure these things out. Leave it to the business owners themselves. I think this is this is this is uh, sheer laziness on the part of the policymakers. This is mm -hmm. low hanging fruit. Let's go after the people who already pay tax. Let's squeeze them down some more. Let's yeah. shake them down some more because we know we can get the money. Why don't we actually demand 
to see every year from the NBR. How many new people, new corporates were added to the tax net on a year on year basis? We as publicly driven companies, you as the editor of, of, a, of a newspaper, you're required to show growth to your, yeah. to your board, to your stakeholders. Why don't we see that how many new people, if you look at the growth in the economy, which has been incredible, uh, thanks to the political stability and the leadership, I think we have every right to say, well, how many more people did you add? Why are we still going after the traditional people? Well, that we, know the numbers, the numbers, we know the, the, the raw numbers in terms of the amount of takas which are um, uh, credit to the exchequer, but that's not the same thing as the number of new taxpayers who've fallen in the net. That number is not made public. You're absolutely right. No, it's not. What do you think about what do you think about the idea? And sometimes I think that, you know, making it easy as well. I, you know, even if you know, not to sound like uh, you know, sort of a Reagan Republican, but uh, you know, if we lowered the tax rates, and the tax rates in Bangladesh are not high, but you lowered it, you simplified it, just you know, to try and incentivize more people to voluntarily submit themselves to the tax regimen, maybe we would actually end up with greater revenues that way than we do with the current system we have in place. Absolutely not even maybe. Absolutely not even maybe, Zafar. It is proven over and over and again, and we can quote you so many papers and studies around the world, OECD papers, UNTEC papers, which show that bringing down tax and making tax compliance easier grows tax revenues. It's a no-brainer. I mean, Bangladesh, uh, we have our tax rates, let's say, from 20 to 35%. An unlisted company in Bangladesh is taxed at 35%. It was reduced last year to 32.5. It's a step in the right direction. But let's look what the world is doing. The Asian average is 21%. Right. Thailand is at 20. Vietnam is at 20. Even the, the whole global average is 24. What are we doing at 32.5? So what message right. are you saying? So you need to bring that down. What you need is a roadmap that, OK, we can't do it in one phase. We can't do it in one year. Over the next three years, we need predictability, which leads me to another very important point. There is no predictability on taxes, on a lot of these things that happen out of NBR today. Let me give you an example. Retrospective effect on tax changes. I mean, this is another one, you know, humdinger. This is brilliant. So what they can do, and they do, is that they will say that, well, this year we have decided that the tax rate has changed. So you need to go back to last financial year we started, and you need to apply that. Hold on a minute. We're a publicly listed company. We've closed our accounts. We've declared dividends. Joint yeah. venture companies have remitted the dividend. You want us to yeah. open out our accounts? How do we account for this? Has nobody yeah. thought of this? Again, I can't believe that they don't think of this. I think they are lazy. I think they don't bother to do the math. And I think because this is, once again, low-hanging fruit, they go after this. This is where I think we need to drive them and say, no, you can't go on doing this because you are now creating creating disincentives to existing taxpayers. Another quick point, Zafar, discrimination between sectors. Mm. And now, we all know, acknowledge, and I think recognize the incredible transformation that the RMG sector has done for Bangladesh. And I am a huge fan. And I know that our business, which is export-oriented leather footwear, has you know ridden in on, the, on the coattails of the RMG business. But yeah. can you please explain to me why the RMG sector only should be taxed at 12% and no other export sector? Why in the RMG sector you can have a 10% tax if you have a green building, but the same green building in a shoe factory is taxed at a minimum of 32.5% at, at, at a maximum of 32 and a minimum of 12.5%. Why yeah. would there be two standards in the same country? Well, no, and of course, and all we've actually been hearing over the last decade, actually, is that how we need to diversify our export basket. <laughs> if everyone agrees that's something we need to do, how exactly are you going to diversify it if you're giving um, leather exporters and other exporters, you're not giving them the same, um, uh, the same treatment as you give the RMG? So and the point is not to take that away from RMG. The point is to give it to the other industries as well. Absolutely. To, to all export sectors. I think, I think that is the... Yeah. And, you know, I've had extensive discussions with the RMG leadership on this throughout the years. And the RMG leadership also says, we don't ask for this. We don't say, when you write the SRO, please put BGMEA, BKMEA. B. We, why don't you just yeah. say for all export sectors? Today, yeah. if you really want diversification, let me give you another amazing story. Um, mm. There was a young exporter, uh, young entrepreneur, rather, in Bangladesh, who realized that thanks to Mr. Trump's recent duty impositions on China, huge opportunity to export hard luggage from Bangladesh. You know, the molded suitcases that we all yeah. buy, trolleys, suitcases. Yeah. Huge business, huge business. 
he found a partner, he found the machinery, he has the money, he didn't even want to borrow any money from anybody. He waited for one year to get a bonded warehouse license, one year. In that one year, Mr. Trump has left office, <laughs> Mr. Sure. Biden is in office. Yeah. We don't know what the duty structure is going to be. He went to China in 17 days. He had all the permissions that he needed to get his business operational. That factory is now churning out uh, textile uh, face masks, cotton t-shirts, made to measure footwear, and he's rolling out the luggage line. Now, that was another FDI that could have come here. Now, yeah. these are the kind of, I have to say, discriminatory behavior uh, that do not help us to promote diversification. Because if I want easier life, I will go down the path of least resistance and I will go down the RMG path, but that's not necessarily the path to diversification. And in fact, I mean, as you say, I mean, it's uh, it's not equal, but it's not as though even running an RMG factory in this country is particularly easy. They also have hurdles to overcome, perhaps slightly less uh, than in other industries. But and this kind of brings me to my next point. You see, one of the things you often hear you know, a certain sort of segment of the intelligentsia, they're always bemoaning the fact that, oh, well, you know, look at the Bangladesh parliament, it's been taken over by business people, and, you know, and that's, you know, and, uh, and, <laughs> and all I can think of is, well, if only, you see, I don't see anything in terms of the policies which are being enacted, which actually moves Bangladesh to being a more business friendly climate. You know, so my question to you is, given that, you know, we do have, um, a lot of influential business people are in the in the in the parliament. If you look at the cabinet, we have the, the commerce minister, for instance, is you know is is a, is, is a very well regarded, very well respected um, in the business community. Even the uh, the finance minister the, and the PM's uh, private sector advisor. These are people you know who have a background in business, you know and. Uh, the state minister for foreign affairs is, uh, is, is, is in the garment industry, and there are many others like that. Why is it then that we still don't see the attention, you know, the type of things you're talking about, you know, as you said, it's not, you know, I'm sure you're not the only one making this point. Other people have made this. It's fairly, you know, it should be fairly apparent to any policymaker. Why in 2021 do we still face these problems? In one word, inertia. I think, you know, okay. we all learned inertia when we did Physics 101. I think it's very hard to get a body in motion, uh, right. you know, changing direction. Now, I have to qualify this by saying that we have come a long way. Honestly, right. as you were talking before the show, Zafar, you know, it's going to be almost 31 years since I, uh, I, I came and I joined work in Bangladesh. And I can remember, you know, in that time when uh, if I were to stand up and say the kind of things that I'm speaking to you today about, you know, I would be asked to sit down and keep my mouth quiet, my, my mouth shut. I would not be able to speak out. So I think what yeah. we are seeing is definitely much more engagement than we have ever done before. I think what disappoints us as a society, as a community, and as business people, is that the policy is simply not enacted into action. Implementation is where it all falls apart. And implementation okay. can only be done by the bureaucracy, can only be done by the people who are tasked with. I see the lawmakers as extremely engaged. I find amazing yeah. levels of engagement, even at the senior secretary, secretary levels. I find that they get it. But it's when you go down the line and then you have these, again, mixed uh, signals. Let me give you an example, another moral hazard. You know, if you're going to reward uh, the tax authorities with a certain percentage of what they can claim back, what message are you sending? All they're doing is they're digging up old files. We've heard these horror stories time after time after time. Now, again, you've got to make these policies forward moving. Uh, in Bangladesh recently, if you're a trading company, you are allowed to net off taxes let's say at the import stage, but if you're a manufacturing company for exactly the same thing, you're not. What are you saying that therefore you should become a trader? Hence my statement the other day. God, I wish I was a trader and not a manufacturer. Now, right. these are inconsistencies that require very detailed understanding, sit down and look at the facts, analysts, and then it's not that we're not doing it. We are from the business community. But what frustrates us that year after year, we go through these engagements with the National Board of Revenue. We've gone through it for years we find very little implementation. I honestly don't bother to give the recommendations anymore. I don't, because I don't feel yeah. like anybody's listening to them. Now, the ministers are pushing them, the secretaries are pushing them. Down the line, when they're trying to add up their budget and they're trying to say, well, how am I going to find money? Oh, easy path. 
go to the LTU. Easy path. Let's go after the telcos. Easy path. Let's go after the big taxpayers. No. That's just sheer yeah. laziness. And I think that's yeah. where we need to catch them out. I think that's where we need to force them. When was the last time, Zafar, you can do some research, that we saw yeah. policy innovation from the NBR? I would yeah. say the bonded warehouse license and the back-to-back -back LC, which, by the way, was Bangladesh Bank, was not even NBR. And the bonded warehouse license was. After that, let's ask them that every every year, can you show us three examples of innovation that you've done that have helped simplify business? You've got to hold them accountable. And I'm glad that now we have a private sector advisor who's trying, who's trying very hard. But honestly speaking, I see frustration there as well because he has to move the same bureaucracy that we have to face every single day. The BIDA chairman expressed his, his frustration the other day. A simple a matter, Zafar, that I think I would like to highlight through your show. Yeah. We're talking about being foreign investor friendly. We've got, I believe, 15,000 foreign expat workers registered under the BIDA, working here on work permits. The BIDA chairman himself has been trying to get recommendations for them to get vaccinated following the yeah. full rules, doing everything. Yeah. We can't. Now, what message are we saying to our foreign investors? I, I sit on the board of two joint venture companies. I don't know what to say to my partners. They're saying, right. that's, that's, a, that's a tough one, yes. They're saying, send our people back. If you can't vaccinate, send them back. We say, no, 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 please. Hold on, hold on. We're trying, we're trying. Now, these are small things, but these create perception. Perception shapes yeah. image. I think we need to fix it at the ground level. Once again, we have the detailed analysis. We need someone to engage. And we need someone who can implement the policies that are actually written. Because on paper, we've got some great policy. It's the implementation okay. that's the bug. And I, mean, I think here's the thing. Um, there are myriad challenges moving forward. One, as you pointed out uh, earlier in this broadcast, COVID has, you know, has changed everything, has made everything much more difficult and more of a challenge for you know, uh, everyone in enterprise here in yeah. Bangladesh around the world, uh, we're not immune to that. But I would actually secondarily think that also, when we see what's happening in other countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, you see, there's no way perhaps muddling through for the last 20 or 30 years as we have done, you know, has worked well. I mean, we've, we've, we've achieved a great deal, but I fear that, you know, that's not gonna work for the next, uh, you know, what's worked in the past few decades is not gonna work for the next few decades. We really need to start fixing this if we want to be um, competitive on a global level in the way, you know, the global market is heating up. Oh, very, very powerful point, uh, Zafar. I have to tell you, if, you know, once graduation happens, and it's a question of when rather than if, right? <clears throat> Let me give you one example. Uh, the Vietnam, which I think on the, is, in the, is in their, on their 60th FTA, by the way, and we are, I think we've got two under our belt. One of them is with yeah. Bhutan. Uh, nothing yeah. against Bhutan, but as as uh, Marisa Nihat yes. Kabir said the other day, slightly larger than Gulshan in terms of the market. So I think yeah. we really need to understand what are we doing. Now, once the EU-Vietnam FTA happens, tariffs on Vietnam will actually go down from 9% to zero. And once Bangladesh loses LDC status, we will go from zero to nine. Effectively, imports from Bangladesh into the European Union vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam will become 18% more expensive. Do we really think the world is going to pay 18% more for a t-shirt, yeah. pair of jeans, or a pair of shoes, or a, or a plate from Bangladesh? The answer is a flat no. We are seeing globally there is a collapse of demand. And everything that we are trying to see in the world, if you look at the $1.6 trillion package that you know, President Biden managed to get through Congress. What is that about? It's about stimulating demand. Okay? Yes. You're just trying to stay alive. You're trying to keep your markets open. Now, there, if we have to increase our costs, uh, sorry, increase our prices by 18%, no one will buy, which means what? You need to reduce costs by 18%. Can you become 18% more efficient in the next two years? The answer is no. We're headed in the wrong direction. So your point that we can't depend on what got us here up till 2020, or I would say 2019, to get us through the next 10 years is absolutely valid. We now need a hard reset, and we need to actually sit down and look at a couple of areas which are holding us back. And I will say time after time, you look at any ease of business doing survey, taxation is at the heart of it. Cost, administration, ease, all three need to become much, much more rationalized and optimized with global standards. Only then you will get people to come and invest, and only then local entrepreneurs will invest in manufacturing 
and services which will create the jobs that we need. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Nassim. This is a really uh, powerful conversation. I hope people are listening. I really want to thank you for being so forthright, for speaking out, speaking your mind, because I think this is an important conversation which we need to have at the national level. And I'm really glad that you are, you know, uh, having, having, you have the courage, you know, to actually try and kickstart this conversation. Anything we can do at Dhaka Tribune together with the business community to move this forward, let's hope that there are people listening. And I think, you know, we have people there. What we need to do is we really need to just, you know, put meat on the bone. As you said, it's all in the implementation. I think if enough people really do understand what is at stake, and as you pointed out, everything is at stake, that hopefully we can move towards better days in terms of doing business in the business climate here in Bangladesh. Thank you very much, Nasim. Thank you, Zafar, and thank you to the Dhaka Tribune. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and honestly, yes, I, I am, at the end of the day, uh, an optimist. I think you have to be an optimist to be a business person in Bangladesh. And I will end Absolutely. on one note. Uh, I will use your platform for one shout out. I think the time has come where at least one Bangladeshi business person, and we've had some amazing legendary figures, deserves national recognition. And I really hope that next next year, when the Honorable Prime Minister decides on the Ekushi Podoks, she will find at least one business person posthumously, current, whatever. But I think we need to give also the business community the respect that we deserve to continue to do what we do. Thanks, Zafar. Thank you for having me on your show. Okay, I agree with that 100%. On that note, thank you. And thank you for tuning in. This has been um, Straight Talk with Zafar Saban. My guest has been Nasim Manzur. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching.